Okay, hello and welcome to the third part of course week four, lecture two. Now some live coding. So we had part one and part two where I was on a Jamboard proving and disproving different things and also doing a little bit of programming. Now I will do some of that again and uh, some extensions. So um, we will start from the code from lecture 3.3. It's also in the DSLs of Math uh, book, that's section 171. So the basic is the core DSL for one argument function expressions. So this is called FunExp here, abbreviated F, and it has four constructors, constant functions, identity function, addition and multiplication, of syntax trees representing functions. Um, some examples from the first Jamboard of 4.2. We had uh, some counterexample material, and here they just included to show that we can check their types. Uh, I mean, we got f bar, we got age bar, and so on, these different um, expressions. Um, and furthermore, uh, we've reusing here the eval function from lecture 3.3, mostly for specification purposes, but later also for some instance declarations. So I've cleaned it up a bit and I'm defining the type S as the type of semantics, S for semantics. And the evaluator just takes a syntax tree, so semantics. And here I've been very uh, disciplined in always using a corresponding semantic constructor. So instead of the syntactic constructor, capital C, I'm using CS, XS, add S and mul S in the four different cases here. And I'm always, when there is a recursive subtree, calling eval recursively on that subtree. And this means that the helper functions, CS, XS, add S and mul S, will have types which are very similar to the types of the constructors. Just everywhere the upper constructors have a capital F, these have a capital S, semantics instead of expression. Okay, and here the functions are very simple. I mean, it's a constant functions, the identity and lifted addition and multiplication. So now we can do, for example, evaluation of age. Well, that's of type S, where we might remember what S is. That's a function, the type of functions from real to real. That means that eval of age needs an argument, say x equals one, and then we get two. Let's see if we're okay with that. It's multiplication of f and g. f is x plus one, and g is just x. So one plus one is two times one is two. That sounds reasonable. And if we evaluate on the other hand, age bar at one, we get one. And you might remember from the first part that we show the contradiction because these two functions were proven both to be equal and to give different values, which clearly can't be the case. Okay, so this was reusing and cleaning up some of the older definitions. I would reuse these definitions further down as well. Um, now going to the tupling transform. By the way, I hope you don't hear too much of the drilling in the next door room. I didn't know they were going to do that. So the tupling transform um, is something we have been uh, recommending as an, in an exercise in chapter one of the course, chapter one of the book, week one of the course, uh, is exercise 1.6. And I'm just reminding you here because we were going to use it a little bit as this and specification world. So a function fg returning a pair. So this is the first argument here, fg. If we have a, such a function that returns a pair, we can basically create two functions from it. A function from a to the first component of the pair and a function from a to the second component of the pair. So from a function returning a pair, we get a pair of functions. And we can do that transformation using the f to p uh, higher order function. And similarly, we can do it in the opposite direction. If we have two functions, a to b and a to c, notice it has to correspond to the same a here, then we can combine them to a function from a to a pair of both a b and c. And th this combination just takes a pair of functions f and g and 
creates a lambda, an anonymous, anonymous function taking x to the pair of f of x and g of x. Okay, and we can check that these uh, types work out. Um, well, I'm not sure if we should run it on some example here, but we can we can look at the examples here then. So here I want to motivate its use. Um, so when we have a function which is not a homomorphism and we want to make it a homomorphism or we want to make a similar function a homomorphism, then it's often useful to combine the function which is not quite homomorphism with a helper. So the example here of something which is not a homomorphism is der, der. And um, we want to combine it with what we usually call, sometimes called deep copy, that just takes a syntax tree and returns it. And if we look at the types of the transformation here, we got a function where a is f and b is f and c is also f. So if we have deep copy and der, then we can combine them into der2. So this is the p2f here. If we call p2f with deep copy and there, so with two concrete functions as arguments, they will be combined into one function returning a pair. I say specification alternative one because we will actually use it in the opposite direction. We will implement there two, and then we will split it up into the two components, deep copy and there. Okay, but let's see then, can we implement this dare2 function? So the specification of dare, if you remember, was that when we evaluate the syntactic derivative, we should get the derivative of the evaluation of the syntax. So this just means that dare is a syntactic implementation of the mathematical operation of derivative, the capital D here, which we cannot implement in Haskell, but the syntactic version we can. Oh, and the, the specification, uh, we can implement a function there, but we can't do it as a homomorphism, but the specification of there too, which we can sort of generalize to and actually implement as a homomorphism, that is a little more complicated. So for all syntax expression Fe, if we call there too on Fe, we get back a syntax tree F and F prime. I've said that f is equal because of deep copy here, but it doesn't actually have to be exactly equal as long as the evaluation of that function that is returned is the same as the evaluation of fe. So for example, if there is an addition uh, in the syntax tree, it's an unnecessary addition of zero or something like that, we can remove it and the evaluation will still be the same. But the key core part of there too is of course the second component where we say the second component of the pair its evaluation should be the mathematical derivative of the evaluation of the input. Okay, so here I've implemented there and deep copy, basically using this transformation before, saying that there are two, uh, of, so first compute there two and then extract from a pair. And I've implemented two helper functions, get f prime and get f, because I want to have a type new type for this because it helps out with the instance declarations further on. So instead of there two just being producing a pair, it will produce a new type with the constructor by around the pair, but it's a minor change. Okay, so to get this flying, I need to implement one, two, three, four, five, six functions and currently, well, and actually there two at the top level. So I, I'll start with the top level here. So there two, which now should not be in the predefined structure. It should have the same four cases as eval. So if we reverse search for eval here, it should be possible to find the definition and perhaps even copy them. So there are two. Okay, so I didn't need to copy that one. Let's rename here everywhere eval by der2. So eval, 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 eval is removed. And then I also have to remove this, uh, change the semantic functions. So I've called them here c there and so on. So actually, if I can do a query replace of capital S, maybe with a space to make sure that it doesn't match too much. 
with their two space. Okay. It caught all the cases except for X. So now I've sort of copied, and this is not true anymore, the type here is not real to real, but the type will be by F. Uh, I copied all these cases to make sure that we have the same recursive structure. So there are two calls it steps recursively, and it just uses four helper functions for the four cases. This is partly to make it clear that it's homomorphism, and partly to make it easy to test the subcomponents. But what about this homomorphism condition? So if you remember the definition of homomorphism, you may recognize it here. This line is basically H2, the two-argument operator homomorphism condition for the function add there to from the constructor add to the semantic function. Oh, sorry, it's not add there to, it's there to, which is from add to add there to. So notice uh, what I'm saying here is that the there to function, which here on the left hand side is applied externally to an add constructor, can be pushed in and called to the two subtrees E1 and E2, and then combined. The result can be combined using add there to. And the same pattern holds here. There too, the same top level function is also a homomorphism from mal to mal there too. Okay, and those are the, the two uh, most important cases here. So let's see. The new type, uh, I've said we have two helper functions, get f and get f prime. So let's define them first. That's just to make sure that we know what, what they're doing. So these two functions both uh, just pattern match on a by. This takes the f component and returns it. And this one takes, whoops, insert. This takes the other component, the f prime component, and returns that. Whoops, that should be an equality sign. OK. Um, so what we've uh, defined so far are the trivial uh, extractors, and uh, they at least make it possible that if we have implemented there too, we should be able to get deep copy and there out. Now for the actual sort of meat of the definitions, the four helper functions. So let's start with C there too. So C there too. Well, it takes a real number. Let's call it C. And it should be equal to something of type by, so it needs to be a by constructor and two components in a pair. The first component, remember, we're always trying to return a deep copy, so that's the constant zero. The second component should be, no, not the constant zero, the constant C. The second component, on the other hand, is the derivative, and that's the constant zero. Okay, at this stage, we can actually call there two on constant six, say, and get the constant six back and the constant zero as the derivative. And this also means that we can call there now, or we can call deep copy. But if we try to call it on any other argument, uh, any other constructor used, then it won't work. So let's move to the second helper function. So x there too is not even a function, it's just a value. And it has to be by of underscore underscore something. And the first should be a copy, so that's x. Um, and the second should be the derivative of x. And the derivative of x is constant 1. OK, and now we can check it by doing there of x, which will return constant 1. And we can do also d copy of x, which is x, which is sort of a, not the, the intended outcome. I mean, we, we, we're not interested in deep copy. It just shows that it actually does the, produce the, second, the first component. OK, um, now we have these two left, mal there two and add there two. And they are both 
taking in two arguments, a by f f prime. Notice the name f prime here is just, I could call it foo, but f prime helps me remember that I expect this to be a syntax tree representing the derivative of f. Similarly here, I can get the pair g and g prime, I name it that. And then I should return a by of something comma something. And I can copy this pattern actually to mull there as well, even before filling it in. So now, as I mentioned, uh, well, lots of noise on the right hand side, perhaps I should actually kill this buffer at this point to fit more. Um, the first component should be a copy. So in the add case, it's add f, f, uh, f g. And in the mul case, it's mul f g. And actually, I think, uh, OK, no, it doesn't like, uh, but there's still the underscores. So I have to add another flag if I want to run it with, with um, the holes. Uh, but in the other case here, if I want to, to compute a derivative of addition, it's actually the addition of the derivatives. So I've computed both the function and the derivative, and I can just add them up there. And this is the, the case that's only the case that does real work and the case that pushed us to create the by data type from the beginning. Because for the multiplication case, we need to add two terms, one being f prime times g and the other being f times g prime. And here is the place where I need all the four components, the f, f prime, g and g prime. That's the only case where I need all four components. So this is the one forcing us to go to the there two definition instead of just there. Okay, so by now I should have a working function. Uh, and this is suddenly very thin. Okay, and now I should be able to try this out. Uh, I think I prepared a few. Um, now, okay, yeah, that, I, that those come later in the in the type class version. So um, I want to call this now on some syntax trees, and I got the syntax trees above. That was the thing. So I got age bar. Yes, here I got some syntax trees. So let's call derivative on age bar, for example. And yeah, it's a long, complicated expression. If we want to analyze it, we can see that it's the sum of a product of sums and so on because of the structure. It's it's a product at the top level, and that means that it will be a sum of products at the next level. And derivative of age, well, if you look carefully, you can see that these two lines are not identical. It says 1, 0, 1, 1, and the other says 1, 0, 0, 1. So there is a constant 0 and a constant 1 here, which is slightly different. But these, looking at these is not very uplifting. You really need to evaluate them. So if you evaluate the derivative of age at the point one, you get three, and you evaluate the derivative of age bar at one, you get two. So this, this is now a case where we actually can compute correctly the derivatives. So the counter example we had to there without the two does not carry over. We now have a correct implementation of derivative uh, using the pairing operator. So this, this um, when I'm calling there here, remember it's actually calling there two of the helper expression. So there two of f or f bar and so on. So it's computing both the copy and the derivative and then at the end throwing away the other. Uh, now that was a bad case. Okay. Um, now we have completed the definition of there two, which was one of the goals. And the second part is uh, to implement a um, type class for, to capture these things. So we have so far the following homomorphisms, three homomorphisms, eval, deep copy, and there too. Notice not there because that's not a homomorphism. So Homomorphisms I can actually implement even in a type class version. Uh, 
I can implement more things with a syntax tree, but with this, uh, sometimes it's very convenient to have a type class version because it's, you sort of uh, work directly with the semantic values. So here I move over to the case where I want to implement these three functions as instances of a type class. And this is, uh, again, make your own type class now for Funex. I had it in an earlier lecture for what I called IE, integer expressions. Uh, and there I took the class, I created the class index from the constructors of the data type of the IE type. Now we do it for FunExp and we should, for reference here, remember that we had um, these four typed constructors of the data type FunExp. Types of our constructors of F equals FunExp. Okay, let's try to implement the class then. So actually the class will be very similar to what's here. So I'll copy it down. Let's we first have to find out the name for the class. Let's just call it fun. And uh, well, let's call the type that we translate to S for semantics. And then we need four names of methods, class methods. And I would just lowercase these. And then we need to replace the capital F, the, the syntactic data type in all places by S. So, okay, what do I have by this time? I only have a class called fun. Um, it has four operations, C, X, add and mul, but so far it doesn't have any instances. But I have all the components in place for creating the instances. Uh, but before I, I create them, I will just create one value. So this is a polymorphic and overloaded value of type S for any S which is in this type class. So currently it can be used at zero types because I have no instances, but at least we can type it. So SQ, well, it doesn't like to, to evaluate it because it says there is no instance for fun F. But if we want to take information about SQ, it says, well, it's, it has this type. So now if we want to create an instance declaration for the class, then we say instance fun. And what do we have? Well, we said we have eval as one of the cases. So we should be possible to make real, well, to make the type S uh, an instance here. So what are the operations when we use, when we had eval? So let's split and look. Eval of C. So here are the four cases, CS, XS, add S, and mul S. So in our class, in our instance declarations, we have to say that, well, actually C is equal to CS, X equals to XS, add equals to add S, and mul equals to mul S. And now suddenly we do have an instance. All of these helper functions, which are made up there, are directly reusable as instance, uh, well, values for the instance methods. And by the way, I like to have instance declarations where there is no, nothing more than a method equal a name, because then I can always look up this name, CS, ah, okay, this is the type and this is the implementation, instead of having them inside the instance declaration. But uh, let's not stop here. Let's say funx also f. So here is the syntactic instance. If this was sort of the eval instance, this is the deep copy instance. So c equals c, x equal x, add equal add, and mul equal mul. So deep copy. I don't have so a instance again. It sort of corresponds to deep copy. So this one can easily be tested. So we can say, what is squaring of type capital F? Well, it's mal xx. So notice I've got a value here, which uses methods of a type class, but given the fact that I've modeled the type class after my syntax tree, I can actually regain the syntax tree from this seemingly semantic value. I can make an instance for the syntax tree itself. Okay, and the main thing here to show is that the type by f 
is also an instance here. So then I will uh, search for the by case. So here are the seeder, exter, adder, mulder uh, cases. I don't know how that jump happened. Uh, so I just have to say c equals seeder two x equals x there two add equals add there two and mul equals mul there two. And now the same sq of the same generic type, I can ask it to be of type by f instead. And now suddenly the value here is not only the squaring function, but it's a pair of the squaring function, syntax tree for the squaring function, and its derivative. I mean, an unsimplified version of the derivative, but that can also be fixed. So, uh, what we've shown uh, here is that if you make a function a homomorphism, then you can create instances for a type class Correspond if you make it homomorphisms from the syntax. So maybe I should write that down. If you can make a function, or if you can define a function, function age as a homomorphism from the syntactic constructors to corresponding semantic constructors. They are not constructors really. Um, then you can also make an instance declaration of the corresponding type class. And that lets you work directly um, so when, when you do when you use add mul x and c, uh, you have these overloaded values which can then be interpreted in different ways, including as the syntax they sort of could have come from from the beginning. Okay, that was all for this part. Um, we'll see what comes later.